So thank you, Katie, and it's great to be here with you today. Um, I'm Laurie Schreiner, so I chair the Department of Higher Education, which has our master's program in college counseling and student development, and then our uh, PhD in higher education, our EDD in higher education leadership. So that's the department that Eileen and I are both in. And um, as I often say, I've been teaching for more than 30 years, 20 of them at the undergraduate level. I started when I was 10. Right? So just want to be sure we are all on the same page there. Um, but one of the good experiences that I had was that I was able to direct a first year program for a number of years and um, was able to secure a federal grant for the successful dissemination and assessment of that program. So if you wonder why is Laurie doing this, uh, that's a little bit of my background is having taught first year seminar for many, many, many years and directed it and uh, then, then disseminating what are best practices in first year seminar. And so I've had the good fortune to be able to do that. So we want you to get to know each other, but I want to introduce Eileen first. And then we'll have you introduce yourselves around your table. So, Eileen. Okay. Uh, I'm Eileen Holm, and I work in a faculty member in the Department of Higher Education. And my involvement in this is I, it, I have a strange brain, I guess, in some ways, because I spent 25 years working in administration in higher education, mostly in the student affairs area. And then the last 10, I actually got my email from HR that said I'd been here 10 years, so I felt good about that. So. Uh, <laughs> that 10 years here working in the faculty side. So it's given me a great appreciation for what happens outside of the classroom and inside of the classroom. So I feel like my role here today is really an integrative role to try to bring two sides of what we're trying to do in this first year experience. And uh, it, it started many years ago, but the last, I guess, major place was I was a vice president for student life at Baylor, where we um, began to implement uh, a uh, we didn't call it a first year experience because our faculty would have never passed a first year experience. <laughs> so we usurped part of the chapel program and made it uh, Chapel Fridays and started our first year experience there. So it gave me a lot of uh, opportunities, mostly to find out what doesn't work. Um, and now I think they're doing things that do work. So that's. that's so important. our purpose today is really to introduce you to um, the exciting opportunities of teaching first year students. There's lots of good things about them. We hope that you're very excited about it. And uh, so we'll be giving some background about first year students, but also framing the course and really scaffolding you throughout. So you'll have lots of opportunities to work with what you've already been thinking about with your course content and how to weave in some of the goals of the first year seminar and the general education goals as well. And we hope to equip you today. So that's our main goal is to give Give you the resources and equipment and opportunity to think and interact and design and dream together. Um, and we'll walk you through that process and give you lots of opportunities throughout the day. So, Eileen? Great, all right. So, if we, we, I always sit and try to think what must you be thinking and feeling coming into this today? And part of it for me would be how does this all fit together? I mean, it's, there's a lot of things on the table, and what am I responsible for at the end of the day? So I want to explain a little bit of that, but before I do that, I know we probably did this at the orientation, but I never want to start this without giving a great deal of thanks to Sarah Visser and Karen Lang, who really gave the foundation for this uh, work. And everything that we do has kind of, we've been standing on their shoulders um, of the great work that they started. So I just wanted to thank you so much for the work that you put in. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, Sarah received her PhD from the Claremont Woo! Graduate School this weekend. Yeah. Woo! Right. So we are very mad at Calvin. We haven't spoken to them since we got the word, and we may not speak to them the rest of our lives. So, um, but Sarah, best wishes as you move there. So the two pieces that really ground this, right, are what we've been talking about, is the life of the mind and the holistic wellness. But when it comes down to it, and you think of your role as the faculty, your role really sheds a little bit closer to the life of the mind, right? So you will pick out your textbook for whatever the subject you're teaching, um, and you will have your class activities, which we can't really see this, can we? Um, and and uh, you will have a, some a latitude and assignments that we'll talk a little bit about later on, okay? But then we also have this other side of this holistic wellness part of this class, and that's probably the part that's a little bit more confusing in some ways. And that really is where the Momentum book falls. And the Momentum book was never meant to be a hardcore textbook. It's a very casual book, as you may have looked at it. It's written from a student point of view. 
um, to students. So it's almost like it's written by students for students. But what we want you to know today is that there's a very strong theory that undergirds everything that's in momentum. So it's not like a random act of kindness. Um, there's some things, there's some reasons why every chapter is in there, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. But this also is where the community connections come in, and this is where the momentum paper and the apex and alpha meetings come in, and we'll talk a little bit more about it. So when you're thinking about this, and as we work with you today, you'll know primarily you're going to, you're going to carry the weight of this site. But here's the thing. We work with FYE programs across the country, and there are a lot of them that are set up this way, where there's this in class and then there's this out of class. But the reality of it is, students don't do it that way, all right? It's, it, they're coming in as 18-year-olds. They have a lot more experience in high school than they do in college, right? And at some point, they're a little bit of a jumbled mess. They're trying to figure out what part of who they are are they bringing to college, and all those types of things. And so the beauty of this class is kind of to say, we recognize both parts of what you're doing. And so the really great FYE programs take it and they integrate these two pieces across. And they say both of these are important. Now at the end of the day, again, we want to say, you're not responsible for teaching the momentum curriculum. But what we do want to say is there's some things in momentum curriculum that might actually make sense for what you are trying to teach. And if you understand the theoretical part of what we're trying to do at a theory level, then you might be able to integrate it into what you're trying to do. So that's what we want to do today, is we're going to walk you through kind of this side of it, but we want to walk you through in a way that asks the question, is there anything on this side that really makes sense for this side? Is there anything that's going to be taught through this that I can actually pick up and use? Is there a chapter or something that I might want to highlight? How does this work with my curriculum? So that's what we're going to be doing today is both and as we go through it. Now we're going to give you this booklet. Um, okay, we did this really quickly. I didn't get a chance to look at the final proof. And of course, there are going to be uh, typos in this, <laughs> all right? So I just wanted to admit that so you wouldn't need to take out your red pen and send me an editing grade later on that we recognize that there are. But uh, these were free to us, so you get what you pay for. So, <laughs> that's kind of what it is. But as we go through, you can use this or not. We just thought this might be a way to help you organize it. We take the 15 weeks of the course. Um, and your, your course, your part of the course, is the center piece of it. Um, and if you wanted to track it through and fill in, this is, your, this is your curriculum. But as we go through this day, we're hoping that you might also fill in some other blanks at the top. You might say, you know, this, this part on hope really doesn't fit, but this part on perspective taking kind of does. So we're going to jot down some notes and we're going to figure out how it fits in your class. All right? So feel free to use this or not as we go through the day. Uh, but that's what we're going to do. Now, I will say, I have to tell you this, and I know this will be a relief. Laurie Schreiner has written down minute by minute where we should be on this day. Because uh, for those of you who know strengths, I have adaptability number one. And this is like a jumbled mess to me. But she will keep us on track. Uh -huh. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I've been totally on it on that. OK. All right. So we're actually we're ahead. ahead. We're ahead. So now we can take a deep breath and relax. <laughs> So I was going to tell a joke because we're ahead, but I didn't. So, <laughs> so one of the things that, that we want to focus on in giving you this opportunity to jot things down is as you design this course and make it your own, because the best courses are ones that you have woven in best practices from other people, but they're authentically yours. You know, they represent your approach to your students, they play to your strengths and your expertise. So we want to be sure that, that we acknowledge that all the way through, that we, that's what we're expecting, that's why we wanted the best of the best faculty teaching in this program, is because you have so much to bring to the table. So as we think about how a course gets designed, uh, we use DFINK's model. Now you've got resources in your iTunes U. So there's an article that you were supposed to read for today on integrated course design, right? There are a lot of resources posted in iTunes U that you can access as you continue to work through your syllabus and your course design. So today we're giving you the overview of that and a chance to start thinking about it. So the way he starts is to say before you ever design a class, you have to know who's in the classroom. Who are the learners? And what do they bring to the table? And what's the learning environment likely to be like 
for these students. And so one of our goals today is to give you a lot of information about APU students. Some will be about last year's first year class, <laughs> and some of it will be of the number that, ha that are coming this fall, this is what we know about them already. So we'll be giving you a lot of information, and we gave you then this physical worksheet in front of you that you can jot down as you're learning some of the things you want to be sure to keep in mind as you're thinking about, all right, as I'm designing the class, I've got to remember um, that I, I might have a commuter in the room. It's not all about the resident life experience. You know, I might have several commuters in the room. Um, so we'll ask you to jot a few of those things down. So that's where you start in designing a class. Then you say, now what is it I want students to learn? Now, I don't know about you, but when I first started teaching, how do you first start designing a class? I looked at the textbook, I counted the chapters, I counted the weeks, and I tried to make that fit, right? And actually, that doesn't start with the end in mind, you know? And, and I teach to the textbook. Well, that was what I knew a long time ago. But I think when we start off by saying, what is it we want our students to learn, that that enables us to design a class that is really focused on the learning experience of the student. So we'll talk about those aspects here in a moment, these learning outcomes. Then we say, and how will I know that they in fact have learned the things that I've asked them to learn? And that's the assessment process and our feedback to our students. Then and only then do we say, what am I going to do day one, day two, day three? What are the things that I'm going to do, not just in class, but outside of class? And that's why the booklet has the preparation assignments out of class space as well. To think about, uh, I don't just think, what do I want students doing while they're sitting in class with me? But it's also, what do I want to be sure they're doing in preparation for class? Or after they leave class, what do they need to be doing? So now we're going to give you a little bit of information about the incoming students, and you should have uh, your cell phones handy, right? All right, so I'm going to walk us through this because if you're 35 and under, you know how to do this. If you're my age, this is a little more complicated, right? So this is a, a, a I, didn't, I didn't call your name, Brian. I didn't even look your way, okay? So <laughs> I try to keep my eyes away. Um, but um, this is a... a um, piece of uh, software called, not software, it's a program online called Poll Everywhere. So if you haven't ever used it, I really highly advise it. Um, it's a way to interact with students. So what you need to do is, you know, when you're putting, the place where you put in the number that you're going to dial or the person's name, you put that 37607 right up there where you're going to dial it. Then in the subject line where you usually put how are you or what are you doing, you're going to put HULME, H-U-L-M-E. It doesn't have to be all caps, just H-U-L-M-E. And you're going to send that. Okay, so if everyone will just send it, then you will get back from poll everywhere that you are logged in, <laughs> and you don't need to log that in again. All right, you only have to do it one time. Texting. Texting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or you can just use the browser. Or use the browser. Either way. Okay. Everyone in. So you're gonna send the number to this. Okay. Now y'all voted early, but that's cool. Uh, <laughs> So then what you do is, for you eager beavers in the room, the question is, as of 512, what percentage of APU's incoming first-year students are women? So you just simply type in A, B, C, or D according. If you think it's 55%, it's A, 61, it's B, 68, it's C, 72, it's 1. And then you just push send once you put that in, and your vote will show up. We done? Okay. So everybody is kind of thinking that 68% is women. So if you are coming to APU to get your MRS degree, <laughs> your odds are not good, okay? I mean, you're going to have to join a church or a military organization or something else, okay? <laughs> because it's not going to go well. 68% um, will be female this coming year. So you do have to recognize that in your classes. Um, it will be the largest percent will be female. All right, next question then. How many black students are part of the incoming first year class? Will there be 55, 72, 118, or 151? Just in the real class, we need 
This is the real <laughs> the actual incoming the actual <laughs> incoming class as of the 14th of this month. Out of 1185. 1185 so far. 1185 is what this is based on. Anybody need help? Got it. Not anyone who's going to admit that you need help? <laughs> right. Okay. All right. So we're going. Okay. So 72 is our highest number. One other question before I reveal it. What non-white racial group is the largest in the incoming class? The non-white racial group is the largest. A, Asian. B, black, African American. C, Hispanic. D, multi-ethnic. All right, let's look at the real numbers. Our African Americans, there'll be 55, 5% of the incoming freshman class. The largest group, though, of, um, uh, of the, the highest percentage is multi-ethnic. Hmm? So multi-ethnic students are actually our largest percentage that will be coming in. So this really re represents a changing face of America as well as a changing face of, higher, of our particular class. And then one more. What percentage of incoming students are low income? So the students who really are at the, the, the parental income or the income that they can spend on college is the lowest in America. So they are our students who are uh, in the lower socioeconomic groups. What percentage will be our students? So we think about 16. It's going to be our highest number. 31. <laughs> Still coming in. Uh, 11. Uh. Okay. The highest, 33%. 33%. 33 a third of every student in your class will be from a low income, um, almost poverty line. Not always, but almost poverty line. So these students have great financial need. So it really changes a lot about what we consume about technology, what we can assume about uh, high schools that they've come from, those types of things. And so we really need to be sensitive to the fact that our perspective oftentimes does not represent their perspective at all um, in trying to really understand where they are. And I promise one more. How many commuting students? Laurie mentioned this. How many commuting students will be coming to this class? 110? 86, 60, 24. So we always think of APU as really residential. What will be the range? Will there be 25 to 60, 61 to 86? These are ranges because it's not completely set yet. We don't know exactly. So actually, we look like 86 to 110, 25 to 60. All right, so we're still primarily large proportion. I want to remind you that the, the outcomes for this course are, are grounded, as all of our outcomes are in every course, in the APU mission. That that's foundational. And because this is part of the general education curriculum, the general education mission is also an important part of this. That we are providing students a grounding in the liberal arts, giving them opportunities to cultivate their understanding and providing experiences for them to develop maturity morally, socially, spiritually, intellectually, and I'm missing one. Brian, what's the one I'm missing? 
Sorry. morally, socially, intellectually, spiritually, and then there's one more. Okay, well, well I'll remember it. Um, it's far from anything. Uh, yeah, that's it, that's it, thank you. <laughs> so that mission is part of where the, where the outcomes from this course derive. And so there are eight of them, okay? There are eight learning outcomes and in uh, one of the resources that you do have, and they are listed here for you on, at the top here, and I have put the ones that are related to academic success and the life of the mind, are that top row, or the left side of this handout. And then the ones that relate to holistic wellness are in the second row here, or are on the right side. So those are the, the specified learning outcomes. We want to give you a chance also to say, are there some learning outcomes related to my course content? What I want students to learn that I might want to add to this. But in thinking about thriving as the overarching th framework, when this course comes down to the fact that we want our students to develop habits of mind that help them be academically successful and habits of spirit and body and soul so that they have the well-being that enables them to really come alive. So thriving is a way of defining student success that expands beyond what's your GPA or did you, are you coming back next year, but really says, have you come alive in this place intellectually? We want our students to come alive intellectually. We want them to come alive spiritually. We want them to come alive interpersonally and psychologically. And so that is the, the framework that we'll be unpacking throughout the day to think about how then do you weave your course content into this vision we have for wanting all of our students to make the most of their time with us as first year students at APU. So I want to give you a chance to, if there are learning outcomes you want to add, there's space on your worksheet to do this. You don't have to decide them today, but sometimes it helps to get uh, input from others around the table if you do not have to add learning outcomes. You have eight, and there, that will be plenty, but there may be some very appropriate. You'll want to be sure to use action verbs. Okay, to think, what is it that I want students to be able to do by the end of the course related to my content? So that may be that I want them to articulate something or analyze something or demonstrate or create or design or develop or identify. Okay? So those kinds of action verbs. So we're going to give you about five minutes to uh, think about are there learning outcomes, and you are not wedded to them today, but it gives you a chance to think, do you want to add learning outcomes that are specific to yes. your own? So the critical thinking, you might want to add to it, although I would say it could be implicit in being able to articulate ideas through written communication, that that does assume a level of critical thinking. But you may say, I want my students to be able to analyze or evaluate. Um, certainly the evaluating information sources for academic inquiry gets at critical thinking as well, because students have to decide, is this a credible website or is this a credible source and, and uh, you know, how do I juxtapose these opposing viewpoints that I've found in the literature. So, but you may want to add something there about analysis or synthesis or evaluation yeah, that's specific to your course, okay? So as we think about the assessment process then, there are some elements of the course that have, uh, that are common assignments and then you have some flexibility. Gary. I apologize. I don't yeah. want to take you off the schedule. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to go back to yeah. processing. Yeah. So, so is there a is there any data on better retention by students with fewer learning outcomes than more? Because eight uh -huh. seems yes. and then two more oh. if or one yeah. more. Yeah. And so so can you help us with that? I mean is yeah. eight ideal? Is eight heavy? Is eight I'm looking at the expert in the room behind you, Shauna, uh, mm -hmm. who does uh, assessment for a living. So, Shauna, I'm going to actually call on your expertise. Yeah, that's ambitious. Uh, eight, eight is ambitious. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, eight, eight's <laughs> ambitious. Mm -hmm. There's the final word. Yes. <laughs> However, I, I would say there is not research that I'm aware of that relates the number of student learning outcomes you choose to students either performance in the course. I know. I, you know, I'll put it on. I know. We need to get our students working on that. Yes. Yes. It is four and four. Mm -hmm. And that's why we tried to separate out the outcomes into the life of the mind and academic success, which is your primary responsibility in the class. So if you want to think about it as those four are the primary responsibility of what's happening in the classroom. Holistic wellness, we hope, will also be influenced, and that's what we're going to talk about today is how to weave some of that in in the way you approach your students. But we have these community connections through our student life area who will be focusing on holistic wellness and those four outcomes. So is assessment going to be separate? Are we, is, is the yeah. instructor going to be assessed on the floor that we're responsible for and a separate assessment on the, the other four? Do you want to comment on that? Oh yeah, I mean I think at this point we are looking at how well does the course as a whole assessment so it won't be on the instructor only. So things I know I was just asked about like diverse citizenship, which is obviously a really complex, huge concept, but where that had been mostly located in terms of the plan was with the alpha groups and projects like City Links, where they're going into the city of Azusa and talking about what does it mean to be a responsible citizen in your community, which for some sections might line up with your um, seminar content, but it might not. So again, faculty friendly is going to be the way to go. Um, Sean and I are going to be meeting this summer to do the more assessment plan, the deeper one. My plan is less is better the first year because we're just launching and we want to know what's working and how do these pieces fit together. And as I was saying at the beginning, I mean, there is incredible in terms of how it's designed, but there are so many moving parts. So we're doing the thriving quotient again, and we'll be able to compare like three, you know, first year seminar and post, like how does thriving look? But honestly, from a kind of an evaluative standpoint, we're not starting with a pilot, so we don't have a control group. So we're not going to be able to say first year made this difference specifically because we don't have a control group. Everyone is going to have it. So those are the kind, I mean, I love that you're even thinking that way because I just started thinking that way like in the last month. But I think that it's, um, in terms of the learning outcomes, that's the kind of thing that we'll be returning to and trying to do kind of a matrix of where they fit. Because you're kind of, I mean, as you all saw from your sheet, you have so many different topical areas. So something you can do with holistic wellness, you're not necessarily going to do with how do you know a saint, you know? So it's just that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, I was just following up a little bit on this question, and this may be a, uh, we need to answer this later in the year. When we fill out the idea form, how do we yes. correlate uh -huh. those and we've done that for you. Yep. We have done oh, that yes. for you. And so and that, that's what we're, <laughs> that's it what will we're be, that there is a handout that's been prepared and we had one of those moments this morning of, I thought yeah, someone so. else was making the copies, et cetera. So we will get them for you. Uh, yeah. But where um, CTLA has mm -hmm. given some suggestions of the idea objectives that match up with each of the learning outcomes. Okay, so you will have that handout. We'll make those copies for you. So there are particular common assignments that are in the course. For instance, the research paper, and Rebecca and Karen will spend time with you tomorrow about the research paper. So right now I'm giving you the big picture, and then we will flesh out details as we go. The research paper is 40% of their final grade in the class, and it's a scaffolded project, and that is they will... Uh, do a draft and get some feedback. They will do another draft and get some feedback. They will turn in a final revision. Now you may decide there are things you want them to do. I mean, how that research paper, whether it's 10 pages or 20 pages, I don't know that you're going to, we're going to say it has to be a certain way. That's up to you. The content is up to you. To say you have to have 10 sources or five sources, that's totally up to you. Okay? You may want them preparing for that research project by going out in the community and interviewing. 
people. You might have them listening to stories of others. Some of you are doing things on storytelling. And so that may feed the research paper. So the, the topic, the structure, um, what that paper looks like is up to you. But 40% of their grade, because we wanted uh, commonality across the sections for students. One of the handouts I gave you that was right under this sheet was the grading rubric. So we are asking you, and tomorrow we will go over the rubric. So again, it's giving you the resources and we will unpack them. But there is a standard way that we want to grade these research papers because they are the common assignment. At the end of the course, we will also, uh, and, and we will work out the logistics, but we want copies of the research papers and we will use a broader rubric from the American Association of Colleges and Universities to select a random sample of our students' work and say, on the whole, <laughs> this is how our students did in their critical thinking and in their um, analysis and in their inquiry and in uh, their curiosity and, and other things that are measured through these program evaluation rubrics. The rubric you have is this will help you grade in a standardized way, and we will work with that tomorrow. Questions? So I have a couple questions. Yes. Um, for the drafts, yeah. are we grading it? Are we looking over the drafts uh -huh. for them? And if so, are we doing it like at home and we red mark it up and give it back to them, or do we sit down with them and go over it? We're going to talk much more about that tomorrow. There's a whole okay. session on that tomorrow, so I'm going to postpone oh, answers to that to the experts okay. who will be walking you through that. Okay. okay. Now, there is also the expectation that every student in first year seminar will do an oral presentation of some kind. Now, you'll notice there's a range there. You can award 5% to 15% of their final grade on their oral presentation. You can decide the topic. You can decide what kind of oral presentation. You can decide whether it's several oral presentations that they're going to do. But the range of how much weight it gets for the grade is something that we have, have set in advance for the, for the sections. We're calling this the momentum paper, and that is when students are working with the momentum textbook and they will have a lot of support outside of class through the peer mentors. Both Alpha and Apex will be working with them. And the Momentum textbook uh, has an entire section on goal setting. And so the Momentum paper is really for students to think about their future and set some goals for themselves as a student at APU. We want students to begin to see their, their calling as I'm a student at APU, this is part of my calling, I'm already on that journey here. And what does that look like? It's also their time to reflect on what they've learned in the course. You can give 10% of the grade to that up to 20%. And then finally, 30% of their grade, which you do not have to keep track of, the peer mentors will give you their um, scores on this is students will in the we're calling it the third hour you know there's two days a week they're in class and then one day is that third hour outside of class there are various community activities that's what you will be exposed to over lunch in these three right. days mm -hmm. and we will also be Eileen will be telling you exactly what uh, these activities are that students are required to do outside of class and it is 30 percent of their grade now what this means is by giving you the range here, you could, by selecting these minimums, have 15% to play with if you wanted to add another assignment because you have a learning outcome you just wrote for your topic that you think, again, you always have to have a way, well, how am I going to know that they've demonstrated that? If you think, well, I can use these assignments to know that, to judge that, that you don't have to add anything else. But we wanted to give you the freedom of up to 15% that you could play around with if there's another assignment that you had in mind, whether that's journaling, blogging, the storytelling kinds of exercises, going out and interviewing in the community, whatever you had in mind, you can add to that. Okay? You just want to think, what is it, uh, that, how will I assess that they have met this particular outcome. Okay? Yes. Wouldn't it be helpful to have a feedback 
few points for participation, otherwise attendance, if it's full. So, so attendance is, yeah. yeah. So you may decide, well, I want to give participation points. In some ways, this is, they're participating outside of class. We would, I think it is good policy to put in your syllabus what your attendance expectations are. So you may say something like, I will take attendance every day, you're expected to be in class, and your grade will be, you know, you will lose points for each unexcused absence. So you can write your own attendance policy. You need to have one yeah, so have, students yeah, know what to exactly. expect. Do you want to add something to I'm that? I was just saying that this, we went around and around about whether or not participation would be community connection, but there's so much else, you know, that kind of is going to go in there. But like what Karen had done, which I thought was really wise in her sample syllabus and the prospectus, says any an unexcused absence will lower your final grade by one point. Excused absence as well. And so this is in the prospectus, but that is a great point. But we're, we're just really setting this up as it's expected. Right, so you do set the expecta expectation they are to be in class every day. And so you can set whatever consequences, and it might be, a, you know, I start taking off percentage points for that. Yeah. And we also didn't want, but because the community connection activities are getting tracked mostly by the Apex peer mentors, we didn't want them to necessarily do the attendance kind of thing. But, I mean, if you do a sign-in sheet, however you keep attendance, that's what I'm planning to do. Yeah. And just dock final points if they miss. Yeah. That's my plan. Another kind of cool way to take attendance sometimes is that if you've given an assigned reading and students are to come with a question that they want to discuss in class, they just put on an index card their question and their name, and it's their ticket to get in the door. And that way you've taken attendance. So, you know, you, we can talk about some creative ways of doing that. Yeah. I'm sorry. I just go along with that. I, I'm, I just want to get a little clarification uh -huh. on um, when we were talking about kind of leaving our Fridays open. Um, I'm trying to figure out how much of the, the community activities we'll be a part of, and if we are a part of them, are we yeah. so responsible for them? So we're going to walk or? through every bit of this. Okay, so great. so <laughs> I, I completely understand okay. your questions, and in yeah. structuring yeah. this sure. day, it's so like, we okay. Will yeah. be Friday morning. Yeah. Sure. Okay. We will be yeah. getting, we will answer that question momentarily. Yeah. Okay. All okay. right, all right. <laughs> so as you think about then weaving your
read it and then post a blog about your reaction to it. So even in what we're thinking about having students do outside of class, it's never just read this chapter. It's read it and then what am I going to do with it? And reflection is a huge part of active learning. I think active learning sometimes gets misrepresented as put them in groups, let them talk, we're done. Um, and really, it's a very intentional process of exposing them to the material and having them interact with it and then reflect back on it. Huh, what did I learn from this? Okay. So it may be that we'll have them discussing or doing collaborative problem solving or in teams, but not always. Sometimes it's asking them to take an individual stand on something or to make a decision about something or to apply a concept to a real life situation. Now I want to talk a little bit about thriving then as the overarching outcome and to give you a, a little bit of background on that as we then head into the rest of the day. Um, the work in thriving is based in positive psychology and I know we've got some psychologists in the room. So uh, the positive psychology movement really was an attempt to rebalance psychology so that it's the total fun the total emphasis was not always on dysfunction and disorder but to say well what's working well in our school systems or what is a healthy marriage or what is a, a good relationship or a, a healthy organization what is it that makes for the good life and so that background in positive psychology with the work of Corey Keyes and John Haight on flourishing really informed a lot of our work um, on what it means for a college student then to thrive. And so since 2007, uh, students and faculty at APU have been part of a research program that has involved over 30,000 college students in the US and Canada and Australia, uh, almost 200 institutions two-year and four-year and graduate schools uh, have been part of this work. And what we found is that as we have, uh, we were looking for things that were malleable about a student that predicted their ability to succeed in college. So that's what we were looking for. We also said, you know, it's, it's too myopic to say it's just all about your grades and whether you graduate. It really is about this coming to life, this making the most of your college experience and being vitally engaged in the experience intellectually and socially or interpersonally as well as psychologically. And so what we have found through the research is that whether a student is a two-year community college student or a four-year uh, traditional age student or an adult learner or a graduate student, whether they're low income or high income, Thriving, these five factors really hold together and describe what it means for students to really, for those who say they have made the most of their college experience. And so it has to do with their intellectual vitality. So are they investing the effort to, um, to be intellectually engaged? Are they psychologically engaged in the learning process? Then interpersonally, are they open to multiple perspectives and, and recognize that diversity is a benefit to their learning and they want to make a difference in the world? They're connected in healthy ways to other people who provide support to them. And then psychologically, it's this ability to see the world um, through the lens of realistic optimism. Do they see the glass as half full? Okay. Now, we use this uh, image of the flower because thriving is what we call a second order factor, meaning it's, it is more than just add up these five things. It's something bigger than that, but these five things always hold together, no matter how we're describing student success. But the stem of the flower, which is the major thing that contributes and helps our students thrive, is the sense of community that they experience on campus. Uh, in fact, we can predict students, uh, half of students, uh, of the variation in students thriving by knowing, do they feel a sense of community here at APU? And we have been uh, tracking our students for the last eight years. So we have eight years of data about their uh, various levels of thriving and sense of community. Then the little petals <laughs> are things that are kind of the nutrients that help feed thriving. And so uh, at APU, we would call it faith formation. Um, 
even on secular campuses, it is the degree to which students say that their spiritual or religious beliefs are the foundation of their life and help them in decision making. When a student says that, they are much more likely to then be able to thrive even on secular campuses. So on a secular campus, we call this spirituality, but at APU, we call it uh, faith formation. The other thing we found is that when students have a sense of purpose, a sense of calling, we might use that term at, at APU, but on, even on, again, on secular campuses, a sense of meaning and purpose in life feeds their ability to thrive. And we've also uh, been able to demonstrate that, that when students are aware of their strengths and know how to apply them into the academic life that they're also much more likely to thrive. Okay? All of these five petals are, are what we call malleable. So if you look at things that predict student success, a lot of the literature is about, oh, they come from a low-income home or this particular uh, ethnic background and you're kind of doomed by your demographics. Right? Because those predictive models would say if you came from a certain kind of underpreparedness, you weren't likely to succeed. But we've been able to show that when students are thriving, they then go on to graduate and to get good grades. Okay? So it's that mediating variable. The other thing we found is that all of these factors are malleable, meaning they're not personality. Okay? They are things we can change about our students. And that's where we get very excited about it because it means that our interactions with our students can make a difference in their ability to thrive. Now specifically, we want to think about with you as we talk about thriving today, about uh, how you can foster that in your classroom. It's not that you teach thriving. Some of you may. You may have chosen that as your topic uh, and I would love to talk to you afterwards. But even if it's not your topic, it's not that you teach it, but it's that we're, we're going to teach you how to infuse these principles and theories into the work that you do with students. So sense of community as the, the major contributor to thriving is what we hope you create in your classroom. When a student feels a sense of community on campus, they feel like they belong to a meaningful network of people and that by being part of us, their needs are going to be met. So specifically, these are the, the four different elements. So a student who feels a sense of community at APU feels like they belong here. We call that membership. They feel like, I'm, and it may not be for the whole campus, but it's at least when I'm with this group, it may be their club or organization or their D group, hopefully your class, <laughs> they feel, I belong here. I'm a part of this. The ownership piece is they feel like they have voice and have a contribution to make. So when they feel like they are bringing something to the class, they have something to contribute. And that you consider their input. They matter to you. So we'll talk throughout the day about ways you can gather input from students. Get feedback from them so you know how things are going in your class. The relationship piece is that they feel a strong emotional connection to you as the instructor, but also to each other. Okay? And that's what we want to build in the classroom. What are the things we could do that could help students know one another, trust one another, feel that they have this, this bond, this emotional bond, that we are sharing our celebrations together, but also commiserating together when things don't go well. And then the final piece, uh, partnership, is feeling like there is something that, uh, that I, my needs can be met by being part of this group, but it's also I can meet your needs. It's that reciprocal relationship that says um, we are in this together and we can do more together than we could do individually. So even thinking about are there particular activities that, that it takes everyone in the class to accomplish would be an example of how you could build a sense of community because you're taking what each person has to offer. Did you have a question? Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm with you on the relationship. I see that in my students across the board that how they feel about their classmates and also their professors uh -huh. matter to their writing in the class. But I'm also reading a lot of the uh, op-eds and things coming out of the business world that says that one of the things that people in a position to make hiring and management decisions dislike 
about the current generation is their perception that um, our students won't work if they don't feel touchy-feely about you. That if they don't mm -hmm. like their manager or they don't feel that their manager is positive enough towards them as right. a person, they won't do their job. Right. And that's, um, I think, harming our students' employability. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to say relationships don't matter, but how do we foster that mm -hmm. at the same time equip students to go into a work world where they will have to work with people that they're not buddies with, especially for people who have no interest right. in that kind of relationship? Right. One of the things about creating community is, is learning to cross those differences and to say, how do I manage conflict? How, and so I think it's not just let's all be buddy-buddy and sing kumbaya. <laughs> that is not it at all. But it is to say, how do I value the unique contribution that each person brings? How do I stay at the table with someone who disagrees with me fundamentally? But we don't gloss over that and say, oh, let's go for coffee. Let's stay at the table together. And so I, I think there's important work that needs to happen. And that's part of the membership ownership pieces, is that they feel that it's a safe environment for conflict uh, and to resolve the conflict. Um, and I think that's the important role of the instructor as well, is to help identify, OK, we're seeing some conflict here, but let's, let's stay with this and let's unpack it and let's say we, we still are in this together and it's okay that we have a difference of opinion about it. We need to be civil. And by the way, that was the fifth maturity was civic maturity out of the GE vision. Okay, I looked it up. All right. But you know, I just couldn't rest on that. Okay? Yeah. One of my favorite techniques of doing that, and it fits in with your positive perspective, is when somebody's having an issue with another person, is what do you, the good question to ask is what do you respect about them? to get mm -hmm. them started thinking in a more positive direction. And they may have all these differences. And I've, all, I've had many people just stumped and had to you know, go think about that for like a right. day or yeah. two. But yeah. it's a good starting yeah. point. Right. And even if it's toward you as a professor, is there anything you respect about the way this is going? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's start from that perspective. Good. And we will be talking through, throughout the day uh, about perspective taking, because that's an important piece as well. OK, Eileen. Now, uh, so Laura, can you give me just one big picture? How does thriving relate to a student's retention or their actually their academic success? So it's the question, why are we even doing thriving? Yes. Okay. So what we know <laughs> is that when students are thriving, they are more likely to come back next year. They will get better grades in your class. The likelihood, again, is that. And so it in statistical terms, thriving explains or accounts for about 20% of the variation in students' uh, ability to succeed in terms of coming back next year and uh, with good grades. Okay? And 20% in our world in is our. huge. Yeah. Uh, that's a huge. So, so we're not just doing thriving because there are five petals and it sounds good and <laughs> it brings things together. We're doing thriving because we know if we can increase their level of thriving, they're more likely to stay at the university and to do better in their academic course of studies as they go through. So that's what we're building in here, is this foundation for students to actually be more successful as they go through. So there is this question then, though, we're talking about sense of community. And I'll just real quickly to say, my brother owns a small business, and um, I always ask him, what do you want from college graduates? Or what do you, when you hire college graduates? He goes, I don't hire college graduates anymore. He said, I hire them after they've had their first job, because I'm tired of doing the orientation to the workplace. Uh, yeah, and so it's, it verifies what, it did, what you're saying there. But the the question is, more than 50% of AP students, uh, what, what, is this true or false? More than 50% of AP students live within 100 miles of the university. So how close are we? How far out are we in terms of how we live? So it's true that 50% live, live within 100 or it's false? Okay, so about half and half. We're getting pretty close here. So what's interesting, honestly, yeah, someone's making the decision for us, so true. What's interesting is <laughs> that a little bit over, it's funny that you are half and half because it's almost half and half um, in our students, but over 51% uh, live further than 100 miles away. 
and 25% live over 500 miles away. So I oftentimes think of APU as a Southern California type of school, but actually that's changing um, in the way and how we're recruiting and those kind of things. And so I think it does change sense of community a little bit for us because we have some students who will not be going home every weekend, do not have that opportunity to go home every weekend. A larger and larger percentage will not be doing that dispersing type of thing. So this sense of community is even more critical for them because they're not doing this, I'm going to go home every weekend until I build a sense of community on campus. They're going to actually need to build it faster before that. So let me tell you a little bit about what momentum does on this topic. Is that really, it's chapter, we're going to, and I'll tell you how this relates to your class, but chapter one is really where we begin. And the chapter is about transition. So we're talking about what is it going to take for them to transition into this community? What does that mean? And it's built on Bridges' uh, transition model. What we're really trying to do in this chapter is nothing more than provide them with a language to discuss the experience they're having, all right? So they're coming to us, and there'll be 1,152 different experiences that they'll be having. So it's really difficult to say they're all going to be doing this type of thing. But we do know that what we need to do is give them a, a way to talk about what they're experiencing that normalizes it so they don't feel. So, so much of what you feel as a first-year student is, I must be the only one feeling this way. And once you realize, no, this is natural, this is what people go through when they transition, it makes a huge deal of difference in the way you think. And so there are really these three phases. And the first one is this idea of closing. One aspect of that is actually physical detachment because all the physical clues that kind of told them who they were are taken away. So I always laugh because I have uh, four older brothers. I'm the, the only girl, I'm the youngest, right? And when you're socialized, I always say I was raised by wolves. When you are socialized into that kind of family unit, you do things like you do not hug in our family. That is like really, and there's a lot of don't throw like a girl, don't cry like a girl, all those kind of things. So I drive an hour and a half to college, and I'm living on a freshman residence hall of 45 girls, right? I'm like, oh my gosh, do they have to keep hugging me? I mean, what is their problem? And why are they not laughing when I'm making fun of them, okay? Because that's what we do in my house. We make fun of each other, and we laugh at each other, and they're not laughing. In fact, I'm hurting their feelings, and I'm like, get over it, girls. I mean, come on. And, I, and it was such a hard thing for me to shift into this because who I was was this particular person, and now I'm totally different. So some of our students may not even know how to do their laundry, right? Some of them, this may be the first time they're having to live with another person 100 feet away from them, okay? So they're having this huge physical kind of, and they're lost. They don't know where McDonald's is. They don't know where the streets are. They don't know the restaurants. So physically, they're struggling. Um, and then they're beginning to have to try to let go of their past identities. So there's always this phenomenon of that first, that first week or two, and they're sitting around in their residence hall rooms, and they're talking about what they did in high school, and then they realize, you know, well, I was on national merit. Well, I was national merit. I was national merit. Oh, well, I was in the top 10% of my class. Well, I was in the top 10%. I was in the top 10%. And all of a sudden, what made them special, what they were involved in, is washed out, okay? Now, in some ways, what we're trying to say in momentum is that's exciting. You know, you give yourself a chance to start over. But we also know developmentally, it's stressful, isn't it? I mean, you were the band geek, or you were the smart kid, or you were this or that, and now nobody knows you at that, and actually nobody cares that you were the band geek. And that's the hardest part, you know, because now they're trying to figure out who you are now. Um, and then there's this, this, uh, this enchantment piece. Now, at some time in their first semester, they will wake up and they will go, this is not what I expected it to be. It's harder, it's easier. I have more friends, I have less friends. I'm lonely, I'm not lonely. They will go through a discouragement piece in the first semester. It's just natural because they have all these expectations, which I'll talk about in a minute, of what this experience is going to be. And some will be met and some won't. It's a natural piece of it. But they will feel this in your classroom. Um, and then this bewilderness. They will not know the new rules of the game. They won't know it academically. They're going to be trying to figure out. I mean, if you think about it, this is the very first time that they're only going to your class three times a week. And then they have all of this autonomy. And it, is, it seems like they come in and they're so excited and they're you know, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed. And then that first test or that first paper comes back and they realize, I don't know the rules of this game because what I did that made me successful in high school is not actually working. And then it becomes very disorienting and they're trying to find their place. So what Momentum is doing is basically, this is normal. You're going to feel this, you're going to experience this, you can still be part of this community. And then the second part is this neutral 
uh, zone that you get into. This probably will not affect them until later in the first year uh, and maybe their second semester of their first year. But you need to know it because neutral zone is just kind of stuck. Like I'm not ready to really commit to anything, but I know I can't be what I was in high school. So I'm just kind of in this neutral zone. If they don't get out of the neutral zone sometime during the first year, I think it adds to the sophomore slump when they come back their second year because they don't know, you know, everybody else has found their group or found their thing and they don't. So we are going to try through the goals that we write and the things that we do, try to get them to begin to commit to some things early on because it will move them from this neutral zone. And then the last one is when they actually start taking ownership of it. So this is how we want to talk to you a little bit though about that's what's in momentum. Again, that may not make sense for you curricularly. In fact, I would imagine that's a little bit of a, a stretch. Some of the other chapters make a little bit more sense. But we just want you to know that's what's in the book. That's what they're going to be talking about. But what goes with your class is every single one of your class, you have two alpha groups, right? So there'll be two alpha leaders and one apex mentor that is assigned to your class. Um, so if you have multiple sections, if you have two sections, you'll have four uh, apex. And you'll have two, uh, I mean, you'll have two apex and four alpha. So really the Alpha program, for most of you who know, has been our historic program that has really been about connecting students to upper class students, the sense of community. And we have a pretty good retention rate at APU, especially because of our selectivity. So we're, we're pretty strong in that. A lot of things go into that. I'm not saying that Alpha is the only thing, but we do know that students that connect to peers earlier on do have more likelihood of, re of retaining. So we feel like this program is still a really important part of what we offer at APU to you is a small group connection. Uh, and then the APEX is our new program, and these are peer mentors. And so these are people who will be meeting one-on-one. -on -one. So I kind of think of it as the AT, as a, uh, alpha leaders are kind of your group. They're going to be getting the group together for different kind of activities and that type of work. The APEX are going to be meeting with them one-on-one. -on -one. How you use them is completely up to you. Okay. Some of you might want to really kind of create a team of people that are working with your class. Some of you may be like, oh my gosh, I don't have enough, I don't have enough time to even get feedback, you know, much less take on another group of upper class students. But we want you to know they're there available for you. And I can, as we go through it, I'll tell you some ways that you could interact with them and use them. Uh, they're really there to kind of help uh, in some ways make your life easier. Uh, but you get to choose how you want to use them. We will have an opening event the week of the beginning of classes so you can meet them um, at that time and do those kind of things. But you should feel free to use them if you want to, but not feel any compunction to. Um, and then you'll receive them from Katie in August, so right. you'll know who you'll have through an email. Yeah. This again, related to Apex, I think the goal is 30 minutes, Tracy, or is it 10? Is it 30? 30. And Tracy gets to do the whole lunch presentation on Wednesday, so she'll be able to share more about Apex. Exactly what they're going to be doing. Um, and then the, the second part of this first two weeks is that uh, Katie has a um, grad assistant that was working on an entire social media strategy uh, because part of what we know for this generation is that that's a great way for them to connect. We'll be using heavily Instagram and Twitter in, in that kind of approach through announcements and pictures of things that are going on and those kind of things so that they'll be constantly getting um, information from the social media piece. But we really left Facebook up to you guys. If you wanted to use it, we didn't want to have a Facebook for, I mean, for FYS and for your class. So if you want to use that, don't feel like you need to. But just if you want to, we want to tell you we're, we're staying clear of that platform for you folks. Um, and if you want to use it and you don't have time, uh, your alpha leaders uh, can easily set that up for you if that's something that you want them to do. They can be in charge of your uh, Facebook group and keeping that activity going and those kind of things. Yeah. So you're saying that we should be at least familiar with Instagram? <laughs> Twitter? The great thing about it is that you don't have to you know don't. Instagram or Twitter. Uh, we've yeah. taken care of that for you. Facebook. I hope you're familiar with email. Um, <laughs> Sarah brought up about relationality in the classroom and media and just what you know, kind of relevant topics for first year. But email will be my main thing. Yeah. At least once a week on the kinds of announcements and things like that. But we know, here's the reality. Uh, undergrad students don't read their email. Okay, so get ready for that. We've got to find other ways to connect to them. Now we do, and they will. I mean, and they're beginning to do it, and I think as the university tells them, you've got to do it. But they tell us across the country that's not their primary form of communication anymore. So what we're trying to do is have multiple ways, but we also didn't want you to feel like you had to have multiple ways. So we took, we took the Instagram, or Katie did. I say we. she got to do all the work, so we. So.
That's a that's a Wednesday. great question. And to, uh, Wednesday, Mike is doing all of technology, and he's going to give you some really good information on how this generation is working and those kind yes. of things. It's a great question. Yeah. No, they are not. Apex is. Yes, and we're going to be getting we're going to be getting all that to you. Yes, there will be a hashtag. Yes. And so again, Tracy's going to have a 15-minute session on just that. So we know you're probably still going to have some questions on that, but we're going to keep our section moving. But we'll come back to that, we promise. Um, and then we just want to let you know the very first week of class, um, there'll be a kickoff event um, where we bring uh, the alpha groups together. Again, it's up to you to determine how you want to drive this. If you want to have the event, if you want to host the event, if you want to be at the event, if you don't want anything to do with the event, that really is yeah. completely, completely up to you, but you drive it. And so the alpha leaders are going to be contacting you to find out and what I'm your wishes are. Kind of yeah, what your wishes are, they're going to be finding out from you what your wishes are, and then they're going to be making that happen. So you don't, shouldn't feel any compunction, but if you want to make it happen, they're going to be a great resource to help you make that happen. Yeah. Off-campus, off-site things? Yeah, I think that's what, Alpha does a whole mix of things. Um, they do on-campus, off-campus. If they do yeah. off-campus, they usually do it fairly close because of the car situation. Um, so it has to be in walking, otherwise we have to coordinate tra transportation. I just want to say, as of this morning, this is how fast things are happening. Vicki Bowden did give financial approval to do like a reception, like cookie or pizza, lemonade event on campus, like probably 4.30 to 5.30ish. Oh, no. um, that will connect um, Apex, Alpha, and faculty. And I'm going to probably be doing a little survey about like what night is better. But I mean, we want to do it on campus because this could just end up feeling kind of as I said, many moving pieces, and so we want you to do and support it and not feel like you're having to create all these things. And also, too, it's all in here. If you get confused and you go back later on and you figure out what I'm supposed to be doing, community activity, you can go to the week, um, and it will uh, it will tell you. And every week you don't have every something, so don't get too freaked out right now. Um, but um, but we do want to ask that if you if you could please put in your syllabus having them read the momentum chapter that does align with what's trying to be taught in the extra, the co-curricular type of piece, we would really appreciate it. And again, it tracks with this. So if you're, when you're creating your syllabus, you can just look at this and see which chapter. But this is chapter one, uh, and it's week two. The, week, the first week is a half week, and so there's no reading. But week two is when we start the momentum curriculum. Yes, that's uh -huh. what I'm saying. Yeah, it's it's all, all so, in here. What we want to do now is to give you a chance for a break, but before you do it, let me give you instructions for when you come back from the break. What we'd like you to do is at your table find a partner or two and think about how am I going to build community in my classroom. Look at, if you want to use uh, this notebook, you can think about what are the things that I'm going to be doing the first week in class, outside of class. How will I build community so that students begin to feel like they're a part of this and that they have voice and input? Is there any part of my content that would fit with transition? So I'm thinking about the immigration thing. It's like, wow, that's all about transitions. You know, that those experiences of immigrants can be very similar to what students are feeling as they've walked onto our campus. So when you come back from the break, um, 
work at your tables, and then we will debrief that at 11.05. So that gives you 5, 10, 15, 20, 20 minutes, 25 minutes before we will kind of call time and debrief a little bit together, okay? And super quick, you all have momentum on your iPads, the book. Yeah, the book is a flip book on, in your iTunes U. The slides are there too. Mm -hmm. That has all the other idea yeah. objectives and where they fit, and really there are only two that are, you know, that relate to the research paper. Um, so, like diverse citizenship, the spiritual ones are all related to the momentum paper. And, community. Yeah. and we'll give you a hardback book in uh, August. They're just in China right now. Yeah. All right. So, grab some coffee or water, and then work at your table.